Hello everyone, my name is Mike Weir and I'm the Associate Editor of Materials Today. I would like to welcome you to this webinar that is being hosted by Materials Today in conjunction with SICE, entitled Multiple Ion Beam Microscopy for Advanced Nanofabrication. Today's webinar is being recorded and a copy will be available at our website www.materialstoday.com very shortly. At Materials Today, we will be running not just one but a whole series of fascinating webinars this year. Also, this year sees our next virtual conference, which will be our second annual event exploring the frontiers of microscopy. Please check our website regularly for details of forthcoming events. Back to today, and it is now my pleasure to introduce and welcome today's three speakers, Mohan Anand, David C. Joy, and Michael W. Feneff. Dr. Mohan Anand has over 18 years of experience in developing and extending the performance capabilities of charged particle instruments. He is the Senior Director, Marketing and Product Manager at the Ion Microscopy Innovation Centre at Carl Zeiss and is responsible for managing the Ion Microscopy products. Dr. Anant received a PhD in Material Science from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. He also has a Bachelor's Degree in Metallurgical Engineering from the Indian Institute of Technology and an MBA from Cornell University. Welcome, Mahan. Hi, everybody. Professor David C. Joy was educated in Trinity College, Cambridge, and studied for a DPhil at Christchurch and at Lineker College in Oxford. He stayed on for four years at Oxford as a Royal Society Warren Fellow, and then moved to AT&T Bell Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey, USA. He was there for 14 years before leaving to take up appointments as Distinguished Professor at the University of Tennessee and Distinguished Scientist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and 26 years later he still holds these appointments. He is past president, as well as a fellow, of both the Microscopy Society of America and of the Royal Microscopy Society. Welcome, David. Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, as the case may be. Thanks. Michael W. Feneff is the president and CTO of FIBIX Incorporated in Canada. Mike obtained a master's degree in materials and metallurgical engineering from Queen's University at Kingston with a specialization in techniques development for a range of beam-based characterization instruments. Mike has been using ion beam-based instruments for nearly 20 years, and since founding FIBIX Incorporated in 1996, Mike has steered the company through a combined management CTO role to become the largest ion beam company in Canada, owing at one time or another more than a dozen ion and electron columns on instruments ranging from single beam FIBs to a triple beam SIMS and most recently a Carl Zeiss Orion Nanofab microscope installed just a few weeks ago. Welcome Mike. Hello everyone. So before we begin let me remind the audience of the structure of today's event. We will hear today from our three speakers. Following the presentations we will have a question and answer session. Please submit your questions at any time during the presentation using the Ask button on the right-hand corner of your screen. I would encourage you to input questions as and when you think of them, and these will be addressed in the question and answer session at the end. The more questions asked, the better the session will be, so please don't hesitate. So now, let's begin. I would like to hand over to Mohan Anant to begin his presentation. Thank you, Mike. Um, hello, everyone, once again. Um, and thank you for, uh, to Materials Today for hosting this webinar. Uh, I just want to let you know that I am the warm-up act and the, the lead acts will follow. Um, let me begin first by talking a little bit about the motivation um, behind uh, the development of this technology. Uh, there has been significant interest in fabrication, especially at the nanoscale, and uh, there has been more and more research into making structures below the sub-10 nanometer size range. Um, there are a number of applications that get enabled by this, from the development of solid-state nanopores for DNA sequencing, to making plasmonic devices for um, energy applications, to deposition and etching and milling for circuit editing below the 22 nanometer technology range. Conventionally, uh, nanofabrication using ion beams has used a gallium-focused ion beam, which has worked really well for removing large amounts of matter, but is not ideal if you want to make structures, uh, say, below 30 nanometers. There have been a few examples where gallium has been used to make smaller structures, but that is more the exception than the rule. Now we have developed um, 
ion beams uh, using helium and neon. And with these, you can fabricate much smaller structures. With helium, you can go below the 10 nanometer range. And neon works very well from the 10 to 30 nanometer range. So if you had an instrument that was equipped with these different ion beams, you could work from large macro structures or microstructures down to nanostructures. The benefits of using helium and neon for nanofabrications are um, helium and neon ions have a greater mass than electrons. People have used electrons for making, um, for trying fabricating structures using sputtering, but the mass is not great enough to induce sputtering in materials other than in thin films. Helium and neon have greater mass than electrons and are more efficient when it comes to sputtering. Now they have a less, uh, they're less massive than gallium, so they remove material at a more controlled rate. They also remove material in a more precise manner because the material removal happens in the region impacted by the beam. You can also induce deposition and etching reactions similar to the way you would with gallium using chemical precursors. And helium and neon can also be used for exposing resist similar to electrons. The benefit, however, here is that um, with helium and neon, you don't suffer from a proximity effect as you do with electron beam lithography. Moreover, the sensitivity of the resist to ion beams is far greater than it is for electron beams. So the main way you would cause uh, nanofabrication or would, you would create nanostructures is through sputtering, which is the physical removal of material using your ion species. If you were to compare the mass of the different charged particles and look at the relative masses, uh, the mass of helium is about 7,000 times greater than electrons, and neon is about 36,000 times more massive than electrons, and gallium is even more massive. So if you consider uh, the, the trim simulations below and look at the graph on the left, um, this simulates the sputtering of a gold film, 100 nanometers thick, due to helium. And the graph on the right simulates the sputtering due to gallium on a similar gold film. As you can clearly see, the sputtering due to helium on the left is much more tighter and more controlled as compared to the gallium on the right. Now, depending on the application, if your application was to remove material in a very controlled and precise manner, you would choose a helium ion beam. Whereas, if you wanted to remove material more rapidly and much faster, then you would choose a gallium ion beam. So depending on the type of application, you should have the ability to choose the appropriate ion species. We have now combined three different ion beams on a single platform, and with this product, which is called the Orion Nanofab, you can now fabricate structures from the micrometer scale using gallium down to the sub-10 nanometer scale using helium and neon. In addition, you can get very high resolution imaging using the helium beam. It has a resolution of below half a nanometer. This is simply an example of a comparison between milling due to helium and a comparison of how helium works versus neon and gallium. So the first image that you see on your screen is, it's a gold film, and you can clearly see the grains of gold. The scale bar is 200 nanometers, and it says machining with helium ions. This was written using helium. If you were to compare that to what you can get with neon, now you see um, a, a size difference here, machining with neon. This is probably the best you can achieve with neon, and you clearly see the comparison to what you can with helium. Now if I look at gallium, I can lay out gallium versus neon versus helium, and you can immediately see the advantage you might have if you had 
all three ion beams on a single system. Depending on what you're trying to do, you can choose the appropriate ion beam. Just briefly, the system that I just talked about can be configured with a few standard options that enable nanofabrication. You can have a gas injection system. Um, it comes with a state-of-the-art gallium ion beam. Uh, you can also equip the system with what we call an X-ray exciter. Um, primarily, if you think of ion beams and you think of the size or the energy range that we use these systems in, typically around 30 to 35 kV, there is not a lot of X-ray produced for doing analysis. So we have the ability to integrate an electron column on the system with the intent of producing X-rays from the point of coincidence of the different ion beams. We have um, a large customer base of who are using the helium ion microscope, and there are over 200 publications. And these publications, a list of these publications is available. If you wish to contact us, we would be more than happy to provide this. And we also have additional product information on the system um, if you are interested. And there is a, it's on the Zeiss website, and we will also provide you with our contact information uh, should you need more information on these. With this now, I would like to turn it back over to Mike and continue with the webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation, Mahan. Um, before we hand over to our next speaker, David C. Joy, I would just like to remind you all that you can input questions as and when you think of them using the Ask button on the right-hand corner of your screen. <clears throat> okay, I would like to now hand over to David C. Joy for his presentation. Well, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my task is to maybe fill in some of the, some more of the background detail that uh, you've been, you, you, you've been hearing about. Why, firstly, are we in, interested in using ions, and what makes them better than uh, the electrons that we would normally use? And if you look at the graph that I just put up on the screen now, what I've done is to plot the wavelength of electrons and various kinds of ions. The resolution of any microscope, the smallest thing that you can expect to see, is of the order of magnitude of the wavelength of the radiation that it's using. And so as you can see here, if we look at the electron beam, its wavelength is typically 100 times greater than the wavelength of any of the ion beams of, of interest that we might have access to. So that factor of 100 should enable us to get substantially better spatial resolution in our images as well as in all the ways in which we use the microscope. Another important aspect is that, as Mahan's already mentioned, ions interact much more strongly with materials than, than electrons. So if you want to do something to, to your specimen, then a beam of ions is a much more effective way of doing it than a beam of electrons would be. And, and finally, uh, it's the way that I like to look at it is with electrons, you, you only have one thing that you can do. All electrons are the same. But once you move to ions, again, as Mahan has already mentioned, you have access to many different kinds of ions. And as a result, you've got a lot of different things that, that, that you can begin to optimize. This has been known for a long time. The images that are up at the moment are just two examples. Back in 1948, uh, people were talking in the Practical Science magazine about a proton microscope. That would be a, a hydrogen microscope uh, as the way to go to get really high-resolution images. And another 20 years on, Professor Levy Setti at the University of Chicago actually built a proton microscope and demonstrated that it would uh, have quite superior performance compared to the electron case. But in the end, it, it took another 20 plus years of development before uh, the, the, the people now at Zeiss came through with this device called the gaseous field iron source, the Alice gaseous field iron source, which is a very elegant piece of, of technology. What you're seeing here on the screen is obviously a much sim simplified view of the way in which the beam is generated. You have this tungsten wire source and as you can see, I hope on the right-hand side of the uh, 
a, a picture there, you've got those green dots. Each one of those dots is an atom. And it's, it's the atom from which the iron beam is, is being emitted. So this trimer, that, that group of, of, of three electrons there, we simply pick one of those atoms as our source. And we, we now have something which is one atom in size. Its brightness, that's the amount of current it can put into the signal, is of the same order of magnitude as a cold field emission gun, if you're familiar with uh, standard scanning electron microscopes. So we've got a source now that's very much smaller, but equally bright and has good stability and an, an excellent lifetime. So this, is, this makes a very tidy package of, of, of hardware, and this is uh, not the... Uh, Orion nanofab that you've been hearing about. This is actually the previous instrument, but I just put it up to remind me to remind you of a couple of other things you might want to know about ions. Uh, one is that uh, ions, unlike electrons, are not much affected by magnetic fields. So if you look at the microscope, you'll see that all of the lenses and uh, the scan system are electrostatic rather than electromagnetic. And another very important thing, if you can see the drawing here, you'll notice that the beam is actually almost collimated. In other words, it looks like a very long, thin drinking straw. It's instead of being sharply uh, forced to come to a point, that, that collimation turns out to be uh, a, an important aspect of the uh, advantages of the machine. So just to summarize what we've said so far, iron beams are of the, the beam of choice because there's no diffraction limit. There's no Abbe diffraction limit because the iron wavelength is so small. The beam spot size on the sample is, of, is actually an image, a demagnified image of a single atom. So it really, really, really is small. And the convergence angle of the beam is extremely small, and so there's, neither, there's none of the normal aberrations which make the performance of the scanning electron microscope, for example, so so problematic. This is a much more straightforward system. Unlike some microscopes you may have heard of, this is not aberration correction. It's building a system which is essentially aberration free. So just how well does it work? This is imaging performance uh, from the Orion machine. We're looking here at a film of platinum on the surface of the specimen. The graph over here on the right-hand side is plotting the response of the, of the microscope to features of, of various sizes. And what you can see is we, we have excellent detail right the way down to about 0.4 of a nanometer, which is uh, a pretty sensational result, um, significantly better than you can hope to achieve with, 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 with an electron-based system. Uh, a couple of other things that are really important ab ab about this kind of approach is, as I've already mentioned, because the beam is almost parallel, the depth of field of the image is extremely high. The depth of field is the vertical range over which everything is in focus. This is key because in an electron microscope, you have to make a choice. You can have high resolution or you can have a large depth of field. You can have one or you can have the other, but you can't have both. In an iron microscope, you can have high resolution and a high depth of field. And the image that I've just put in here shows you that you're looking at essentially a cube uh, with uh, a width of uh, about one and a half micrometers top side to side, top to bottom, and back to front. So everything within that, 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 that cubic area is pretty much equally sharply in focus. This adds a huge amount of information to every image that we collect in the microscope. What signal do we actually use? We use secondary electrons, which uh, in my mind are these, these the signal of choice, they've been around for a long time and have often been treated as uh, not the optimum thing. In fact, as we now know from very recent research, se secondary electrons are in fact uniquely capable because as I show in this, this pair of illustrations here, they cover everything from something which is macroscopic. On the left-hand side here is a, a package chip assembly, and so we're looking at that at a magnification of just a few tens of times. Whereas over here on the right-hand side is an image of single atoms, again, collected using the secondary electron image. 
you can go seamlessly from that sort of scale to the macro scale and, and anywhere in between. So the secondary electron signal that we generate with this machine is extremely capable and, and, and versatile. There's nothing that you would want to look at that you wouldn't be able to see using this particular approach. If we want to understand a bit more, we need to look just somewhat at the interactions of the beam. This figure here on the left-hand side, we're looking at these are computations of where the electrons go. Uh, the sample here is silicon, and the top image here is 10 kV, and then the lower one is, is for 30 kV. As you can see from the scale marker, the electrons in this case travel of the order of a micrometer or more in into the sample, and that means that we collect a lot of our signal not from the surface where we're interested, but from deep down into the sample. And of course, the beam is also spreading laterally as it goes down. So the electron case is rather poor. If we compare that on the same scale with the, with in this case, a helium beam at 10 kV or a helium beam at 30 kV, you can see the size of the interaction volume is dramatically reduced. All of the information is being generated at or very close to the surface. And that makes a huge difference in terms of what we can see. If you look at an image side-by-side -side comparison of a scanning electron microscope on the right-hand side and a helium ion microscope on the left-hand side, the large-scale features, of course, uh, appear in both cases, but you look at the helium image, you can see all of this additional information that the, uh, the nanoscale dots of material on the surface, for example, are completely invisible in the electron beam case because, as we've just seen, the electron beam is blazing through the, the specimen and going deep down inside, and we're mostly imaging things that we don't really need to know anything about. So we get much higher surface contrast when we use an, a, 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 an iron beam of any kind as compared to the corresponding electron case. This also means that you can look at things which would be in general, essentially completely transparent to the electron beam, but will produce good imaging in, in information in a, a helium beam. Uh, on the left-hand side of this image, we're looking at a monolayer of gold. You can see nice, well-marked detail, just a single monolayer. And then on the, uh, the, the right-hand side here, this is evaporated gold on carbon. And again, you can see that extremely thin film, just fractions of a nanometer thick, gives you high contrast, high imaging contrast, and, and detail. So in addition to all of the other good stuff that you're going to be hearing about, the helium ion microscope and its, its associated tools really are going to be the best way for us to be doing imaging in the 21st century. You look at something like carbon nanotubes, for example, I've put a comparison a pair of images up here on the left-hand side. It's how carbon nanotubes look when you look at them in a conventional scanning electron microscope with an electron beam. You can see, in fact, a lot of the things we've already discussed. Most of the image is out of focus because we're looking at a three-dimensional mat and only some fraction of that is in focus. And secondly, the beam is penetrating through the material, so you, you, you don't get high contrast and you get a, a lot of out of focus and not very useful detail. You look at the corresponding helium ion beam signal, not obviously not the same area, but now you can see the carbon nanotubes actually have a surface, they have contents inside, and they have structure on the outside. Uh, orders of magnitude more information there than anything that you could have got in the electron case. And putting all these things together, because it is running by the same rules as the scanning electron microscope, one of the main signal modes that you will be using will be the topographic contrast mode. This is where the signal varies as a function of the angle of incidence to the beam. And here, the combination of that and the extended depth of field that we've been talking about means that you can look at very complex structures 
like this one here. And you, I, I think these are just magnificent. This isn't an image that I took, so I can praise it. You can, uh, you can look at something like this. You've got a huge field of view, a huge depth of focus. You've got surface detail. You've got microscale detail of, of ev every kind, an overall resolution here of about 0.8 of a nanometer. Uh, just, ju just a beautiful example of what the machine is able to, to deliver to you. So are there no problems? That, of course, would be asking a little bit too much. So there are a couple of things you, you need to know about. Charging is more likely than it is in a scanning electron microscope. That's because the yield of secondary electrons, the number of secondary electrons that we make, is much higher. So you're taking more charge out of the sample, and unless it's a good conductor, then it will acquire a potential. So to overcome that, the uh, system comes with a flood gun arrangement, which enables you to uh, put electrons onto the surface and just bring it to charge balance. But there are also other schemes that are currently being investigated uh, gas injection is, is, is a useful one, which should be able to uh, keep this problem un, under control for us. The second thing is that ion beams will modify and damage surf surfaces even at fairly low doses, uh, because as Hans already pointed out, their mass is substantially higher, so when they hit a surface, they normally uh, push they, they break some, some of that away. And so when you're planning to look at something, you, you need to understand that you don't want to go immediately to high magnification, for example, because you may drill out a, a substantial m amount of the material that you would otherwise uh, want to look at. So you start at low mag and work up. The final thing which uh, I think is going to be important in the long term, although at the moment it's still something we're thinking about, is as has already been mentioned, ion beams don't really generate x-rays until you get to very high energies. So since doing microanalysis in a microscope is, is a very important ac activity, you need some alternative way of, of trying to do chemical mi microanalysis. And the way that looks most promising for the helium ion microscope is the so-called TOF-SIMS approach, which what you do here is you allow your incident ion to, to hit the material, and essentially you get a splash of both neutral and, and, and charged ions from the specimen. You then suck those away, and you measure their mass-to-charge ratio, and from that you can identify what, what, what kind of uh, material it is that you're looking at. To show you this uh, example here, how much, in, in, how much chemical information you can get from a specimen. This, as you can see the details here, it's actually a gallium beam in this particular case, an area 50 by 50 nanometers in size. You're, you're identifying a large number of elements, elemental pairs, contaminants, multiply charged ions, all sorts of things, a huge amount of, of, of detail there. So this is going to open up some, some, some very important new areas in microanalysis at the nanoscale. So just, just to summarize, uh, from my perspective, ion beams are great because you get both better resolution and a higher depth of field. That's a win-win situation. And ultimately, I believe the resolution of these machines is going to go subatomic, even on a bulk specimen, which is going to be a, an absolutely amazing thing. Much better image contrast and less noise. And because you've got access now to several different kinds of ions, you can optimize the system for various kinds of, of, of samples and approaches. And coming soon, I think, state-of-the-art chemical microanalysis with ion beams. So thank you very much for your attention, and let me hand you back to Mike. Thank you very much for your presentation, David. And before handing over to our third and final speaker, Mike Finesse, a final reminder that you can input questions as and when you think of them using the Ask button on the right-hand corner of your screen. So without further ado, it's over to you, Mike. Thanks very much, Mike. So hello, everyone. As you can perhaps see from this slide, today I'm going to aim to quickly walk you through a range of nanofabrication applications using focused ion beams. And I'm further going to define that, or choose to define it, nanofabrication as modifying a sample on the nanometer scale 
for functional reasons and not merely for sectioning to examine subsurface features. Now, I don't want to de-emphasize the sort of art and science, which is making a TEM or an SEM cross-section using a focused ion beam. It's actually very important and takes a lot of skill. But for today, I'm really going to focus on this uh, approach where nanofabrication is for a functional purpose. You're trying to create a structure at the end that is going to do something for you. And I'm furthermore going to talk specifically about direct nanofabrication with gallium, helium, and neon ion beams, with or without a uh, decomposable gas. So I'm not going to talk about things like ion beam lithography, which was mentioned earlier, which is still very powerful, just going to be outside the subject of what I talk about today. So going back to where I got started in this, the days of single beam fib, I have a nice little schematic here. Just to make sure everyone's on the same page, we're really talking about a scenario where we have a primary ion beam, shown as gallium in this case, that's going to come down and interact with your sample and create, as you can see on the left-hand side, a number of sputtered neutral particles or ions. And one thing to note has been mentioned earlier is if you happen to have positive primary beams and also image looking at positively, positively charged secondary ions, you have a fully positive imaging path, and that allows you to neutralize dynamically, that you actually can use a low-energy flood gun to dust your sample with electrons and keep the charging at bay while you're dynamically imaging. It's also possible to multiplex this on and off so you can image with secondary electrons. And finally, not to be forgotten, because it's very important for nanofabrication, is the ability to bleed gas into your chamber allow that to land on your sample, and then selectively decompose it in the presence of the ion beam, either to create a three-dimensional structure or to reactively interact with your substrate to either increase selectivity or increase the etch rate, removal rate, of your material. So I'm going to walk briefly through a few applications here. On this slide, you'll see on the left a picture of the Lincoln Memorial. Note the scale bar. This is actually based on an approach that was developed at the National Research Council of Canada with their FIB system back in the um, late 90s. It's what we call dose-modulated grayscale rendering. And the main idea here is you would take an image, modify it slightly, and then you would vary the gallium dose going into the substrate, in this case silicon, and at the end of the process you would end up with the appearance of a three-dimensional image. And uh, the key thing here is to note this is actually not very topographic. It's quite shallow. It is possible to create three-dimensional structures, but in this case, this is really just uh, an image modulation that's giving you the appearance of grayscale. And their goal when they looked into this in the first place was actually to create a permanent nano archive by being able to write with a silicon beam into diamond and use that to preserve um, images and information on the nanoscale. On the right-hand side, we have an example of actually a three-dimensional nanofabrication using a gas precursor. So we have a little movie to run here, if you could go ahead and run that. And what you're going to see is this is a tungsten hexacarbonyl gas being bled onto a silicon surface. We're actually imaging with an electron beam while the ion beam is being patterned to selectively decompose the gas only in the presence of the ion beam. And the patterning parameters, the rate at which the ion beam is being moved, is being chosen so that we can create this three-dimensional spiral with about a 600 nanometer diameter, about 120 nanometer thickness to it. And as we grow vertically off the surface at a point about three twists in, we change the actual patterning parameters and we change the rate at which the vertical growth is occurring. So once again, this is inside a focused ion beam system with gallium with an electron beam running at the same time to create this image that you're seeing. And we are selectively decomposing a gas which is present in the chamber as well to create this small tungsten coil or spring. And we can vary the vertical growth rate as we go. So thanks very much. I think we can move on to the next slide. So just a few
few more quick applications here. These are gallium fib applications where we're direct writing into a metal film sitting on a glass or, or some other substrate. We have gratings and circular arrays. And then another similar theme is actually direct writing of zone plates. And here we're nanofabricating the material to actually create each one of the topographic structures you see, whether it's a classic zone plate or a sieve style zone plate. So we're removing the material by sputtering. And depending on the patterning parameters we choose, we get different sputtering rates and we can achieve different resolutions, even with a gallium beam. One of the important points in any nanofabrication uh, whether it's a gas-based process or a direct sputtering process, is really what we call the, the phrase patterning parameters matter. And you really do have to be concerned about what your patterning parameters are. And by that, I mean things like the dwell time, the dwell spacing, the vector scanning style, beam current, etc. Because how you control the beam greatly impacts your end result. And I've tried to show that with this slide. We have here four different patterns of the same shape, an, an annulus or donut structure. And for each of them, we've used the same beam current, and we've had the same amount of dose delivered to the sample. That is to say, the ion beam's been on the sample for the same amount of time. The only difference is how we guided the ion beam. So on the left-hand side, you can see the case where we actually delivered the beam in a single pass, and we started at the 6 o'clock position and we milled up towards the 12 o'clock position. And as we went, you can see that the silicon substrate material was redeposited in behind where the ion beam had been. And that ended up with a result that the central pillar we were trying to create ended up being covered in part by the redeposited material. You'll also see in the foreground at the 6 o'clock position on the donut, we have a very shallow, and at the far end, at the 12 o'clock position were much, much deeper. Now on the second example from the left, we've now delivered the dose in a very different way. Now we're delivering it in following the vector path winding in from the outside to the inside and back again multiple times. And what's resulted here is a much more uniform removal of material, but as you can see, it's not nearly as deep for the same amount of time on the sample. The final two examples uh, on the right-hand side, we've started with that same vector approach, but on the third sample from the left, we began at the center near the pillar, and we spiraled outside in a single pass, whereas on the final example on the rightmost, we started at the outside and spiraled inward. And as you can see, depending on where you finish, your redeposited material ends up at the opposite surface, so you can either have a very clean outside or a very clean inside. But the key thing here is, that how you control the beam will greatly impact your end result in nanofabrication. And this next example is courtesy of Dr. Dan Picard at the National University of Singapore. And you see here on the left, he has machined a fractal structure into about a 40 nanometer thick aluminum membrane. And then for comparison in B and C, we have a similar structure that's machined with the helium ion beam in the Orion. Now you can see for one thing a comparison of the resolution that's achievable, and one may be able to argue perhaps one could achieve a little bit better result with gallium. But what I'm trying to show you here is actually a zoom in looking at some of the detail that is apparent in the redeposited material on the aluminum. Because it's sort of a key point to say all of these ion beam techniques have their artifacts, of course, but it's not perhaps thought of as frequently as it should be that gallium fib, while very powerful, also has some potential artifacts, in part because of the possibility to alloy the gallium with the material that you're sputtering directly. So along that theme, we have a couple of examples here of potential artifacts we have run into in the past. On the left-hand side, you'll see a series of experiments looking at nanocrystalline materials, uh, nanocrystalline nickel, cobalt, and iron alloys. And in the upper left, we have a case where we are looking at a 45-degree cross-section where we have milled and then imaged with the gallium ion beam. And you can see the black arrows here indicate the original surface, and down below that, you see the cross-section face. On the left, 
you'll see that there was no protective coating on this surface, and that it appears that the grains are much larger at the surface than they are down in the subsurface on the cross-section. On the right, you'll see that there was a protective coating which was applied prior to sectioning, and there's no sign of grain growth. This happens to be a different alloy, but it's a similar effect. And that's much more noticeable down below, where you see that we have a bulk nanocrystal and nickel alloy where we did normal incidence nanomachining, and it appears at the bottom of this trench that we've grown that there's been a great deal of focus ion beam induced grain growth. And so this is a bulk nanocrystal that now appears to have micron sized grains in it. On the right hand side, we have a case where we had a partially complete TM sample a colleague of mine had put together and uh, left for a couple of days before she returned it to the microscope. And it originally had a nice gallium arsenide substrate with a gold interconnect post. And just through exposure to the air and the copious amounts of gallium around from the beam and the gallium arsenide, we created a artifact of this three-dimensional structure that had grown out. So there are some potential artifacts that need to be considered, certainly. Perhaps the most famous of these actually occurs in copper, where if you mill copper with the ion beam, depending on the grain orientation you're milling into, you can get some artifacts forming. We have a case here where we looked at three single crystals of copper in the 111, 110, and 100 orientation and found relative to the 110 orientation, the sputter rates of the other two were in fact much faster. So in an experiment, we looked at milling 110 type copper on axis and then tilted 10 degrees off axis, and you can see in the same 110 type grain on axis, we have this apparent contrast variation at the bottom of the trench, which is really not consistent with a single crystal. So we made a TEM section through that, and were able to take a look and find that there was actually an anomalous phase that had formed at the bottom of the copper trench and electron diffraction showed that that was actually formation of copper 3 gallium, almost 80 to 100 nanometers thick. And what was interesting, this is a, another TEM sample that was made, and the arrows that you see here indicate the normal to the surface of the trench. And it appears that the copper 3 gallium ceases to form right around the point where the normal to the surface is no longer parallel to the incident gallium ion beam. So the key thing to consider here is that there is obviously something that's happening with the 110 type plane. I'm a metallurgist by training, so to me everything is uh, sort of a hard spheres model. But if we take a look at this hard spheres model of 110, you can see the gallium fits quite nicely down in between that. So there's probably some degree of channeling and alloying that's taking place allows us to form this anomalous copper 3 gallium phase. Whatever the physics is, we, there's no doubt that there are some truly wonderful things that can be done with gallium focused ion beam technology, but it's not without potential artifacts. And it's particularly true when you're nanofabricating at near normal incidence. When you're cross sectioning, you have much more of a glancing angle, and these, these artifacts are less likely to occur. But when you're bringing your beam in normal to the surface or nearly normal to the surface, one has to watch out for that sort of effect. So moving to some comparisons now, this is some work done on our, our new um, Orion Nanofab microscope where we wanted to increase the beam current of our helium ion beam so we could get sputter rates that were commensurate to what we would do with, say, a 10 picoamp gallium beam. So if I haven't put you to sleep in my presentation to date, this image on the left may. But this is essentially a four micron field of view that we milled a gold on silicon nitride sample just with a 50 picoamp helium beam. And this took just a few seconds to actually pattern in this structure. And on the right, you can see a similar gold film that we milled with 10 picoamps of gallium with 150 nanometer pitch between the lines. And in the small image at the top, in the circle here, you have a comparison of 150 nanometer pitch as three periods of the same gold film being milled with 50 picoamps of helium. So milling uh, with higher beam currents on the gas field ion source is something that still needs some development work, but it looks quite promising.
Now, there are a whole number of uh, examples that are beginning to come out in the literature of using helium and neon for through-film nanofabrication. And this is some work that was done jointly between the Zeiss Applications Lab and Dr. Nestor Zaluzic at the Argonne National Lab in the U.S. This is a 100 nanometer gold film, which was nanomachined in about two minutes to create a four nanometer electrode gap. And then at Argonne, they did TEM imaging, uh, lattice imaging, and you can see that the gold lattice is very beautiful at this point. It really shows very little sign of being disrupted by the helium beam. So this is very promising in terms of being able to do very fine, high-fidelity nanomachining with minimal disruption to the matrix. This is work now on slide 52 that uh, was done by the group of Adam Hall at the Joint School of Nanoscience and Nanoengineering in Nan North Carolina. This was an interesting experiment where they took a silicon nitride membrane and they delivered a dose at the top surface of the membrane and did atomic force microscopy of both the top and the bottom of the membrane as a function of dose. And if you look at the bottom row C here, you'll see reconstructed cross sections where it's very obvious that you begin sputtering at the direct side on the top of the membrane and the helium transits the membrane and begins sputtering for you at the bottom. And this is a very interesting phenomenon that I think needs further exploration, but it uh, could and has led to some very powerful results in terms of being able to make very large, high aspect ratio, very, very high aspect ratio anyway, structures through suspended membranes. We have another example of this here where we took a 100 nanometer thick gold film, the Zeiss Applications Lab. And on the left-hand side, you'll see a standard helium ion microscope secondary image with a 50 nanometer square pore drilled through this membrane. And uh, you'll see it is black where they've machined right through. There are no secondary electrons coming out. But in the top right, you'll see an interesting transmission holder where the sample can be held above. And then there's a mirror converter that takes the transmitted ions, generates secondaries that can be picked up. And in the bottom here, you will see helium ion transmission image of a number of these nanopores. You can see a nice square nanopore down here, very cleanly done at 100 nanometers. And then a series of pores, it looks like this is missing a zero, but these are actually a pair of 50 nanometer pores, also very decent fidelity. And if you make it all the way down with the eye of faith uh, on your PowerPoint, you may not be able to see, but there are in fact signals coming from a five nanometer pore through this 100 nanometer membrane. So the 50 nanometer pore took only about 45 seconds to drill. And as you can see, we can develop about a 20 to one aspect ratio that's achievable without using gas assisted etching. So this is very promising for a number of nanofabrication applications. And I'll end with a, a final slide that shows some semiconductor nanomodification using various gases with both helium and neon ion beams. In the top left, we have an example where we have 50 nanometer conductive lines that have been deposited. These are, uh, have been measured to have 100 microohm centimeter resistivity, which is very decent for ion beam techniques. In the center on the top, we have 15 nanometer insulator bands that were measured with 10 to the 11 microohm centimeter resistivity. Once again, an excellent resistivity for an ion beam induced insulator. And then we have a 20 nanometer metal line array generated on a 50 nanometer pitch. And these are, once again, they're deposited metal lines from gas flowing everywhere on your sample underneath the beam, but they only decompose where the ion beam is present. And in the bottom, we have a couple of images from a series of slices that we acquired on our Zeiss cross beam. So this is a sample of uh, copper interconnect in an IC where the neon beam in the Orion was used to mill down first through the dielectric material and then to ultimately cut the copper line underneath. And then just a protective coating was deposited, a protective insulator was deposited prior to our sectioning. And if I could ask that you could run the movie for me here, we just have a series of slices. And these slices are acquired at uh, three nanometers in the X and Y dimension and then uh, each individual slice is about five nanometers in thickness. So we're just going to run through this via and cut. So hopefully that's playing for you. So you can see that a very uh, small 
narrow cut is able to be achieved in the copper using the neon beam. And once again, this was achieved without the resorting to any type of gas chemistry to enhance the sputtering rate or the, the removal rate of the copper or the dielectric. So thank you for that. And we'll move on to the last slide. So in conclusion, I've tried to give you just a, a very small taste of some of the nanofabrication applications that are um, made possible with the Orion Nanofab, which combines a gallium-focused ion beam and helium and neon gas field ion sources. There really is an entire new world of possibilities to explore with this instrument. Thanks very much for your attention. And thanks for all of the colleagues who were also kind enough to share their examples and their knowledge for this presentation. Okay, well, thank you very much for your presentation, Mike. Um, all three talks today have been very interesting indeed. And that brings us now to our question and answer session. And I can see that our participants have been very busy submitting questions for our speakers. Um, so what I'll do is I'll pose the questions to, to a specific speaker um, but feel free to, to pitch in and, and help each other out with the, with the answers. Um, so I'll start straight away um, and I'll ask a question to Mahan, uh, which someone asked during his presentation, which is, what is the exact role of the helium or neon to give the high resolution? Um, is it high resolution imaging or high resolution fabrication? I guess you can do both using um, the helium and neon ion beams. You can use the helium beam for imaging, and as uh, David Joy explained, you get a very nice secondary contrast and additional benefits, and the resolution there is below half a nanometer when it comes to imaging. By simply changing the dose, you can then go into a mode where you're now fabricating or machining using the helium beam. And there you saw some examples that Mike showed, um, the ability to cut into gold and a variety of other materials. Neon offers a, a much faster machining rate, a much faster sputtering um, of a variety of materials compared to helium. Uh, there, the resolution of the beam is sub two nanometers, and it has, again, the ability to very precisely cut and uh, machine features, uh, which was, again, the example, the last example that Mike showed with the copper interconnects. Uh, you can also use neon for imaging, and neon shows very nice channeling contrast, uh, especially in things like copper, um, and that, that can be extremely useful for studying the orientation of the grains. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another question here which I'll pose to David. Uh, and the, the, the question is, uh, I would be grateful if you could please explain why the resolution of the SEM column is better than the resolution of FIB column in regular dual beam platforms. Yes, I think the, uh, the answer to that is that the quality of the optics and the aim of the optics is, is rather different. In the SEM, you can use a very short working distance and you can set the system up to give you optimum imaging, whereas in, in a FIB, you are going to be transmitting a much larger current through there. You need to be able to position specimens uh, where you need them in the beam. As a result, you have longer working distances and that uh, reduces the available resolution of the system by, uh, by quite a significant factor. Excellent, thank you. And we have a question here which I believe should be posed uh, to Mike, uh, which says, why use diamond as a substrate for a nano archive? Why not silicon carbide amorphized with any ion beam? <laughs> Well, that's an interesting question. I think it's a little bit outside my field. Um, the reference that I had shown on that slide to the work done in 1997, they were using diamond. This was actually work, I believe, that uh, was done for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in the U.S. So the intent was that they would actually transform the diamond subsurface to graphite using the silicon beam. And uh, so part of their intent there was to have the uh, protective hardness of the diamond that would make it uh, 
very resistant to any abrasion in the future. So I believe there were a number of uh, reasons why they chose diamond that perhaps had little to do with the ion beam and much more to do with the final application of the structure. Okay, thanks, great. Okay, uh, a question then to pose to Mahan. Uh, we have a few people asking um, where they could go to find out um, a rough cost for an Orion system, please. Um, the easiest way would be to send me an email and I would be happy to direct you to your local sales organizations because we have people from all parts of the world. Um, it would be easiest for, for me to uh, get you connected with your local uh, salespersons and they can help you uh, put together a quotation for, for the system. Um, my, my email address is, um, I think you would get this through the presentation, but it is mohan.anant at zeiss.com. And I'd be more than happy to respond to any such requests. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll have another scientific question. I'll open this one up to the whole floor. Um, when we're in imaging mode, are we not damaging the structures before taking the image? And how important is that damage? Well, the answer to that, of course, is yes, there is always damage. And uh, that's why I mentioned that when you are imaging with the instrument, you have to think about doing things in the right order. That is, you start off with the lowest magnification field, the largest field of view that you want, and only increase that as necessary. Otherwise, by the time that you, you, you get to the sort of scale you want, you may well have destroyed multiple layers of, of, of the sample that uh, would have contained useful information for you. Uh, the, as, as, as you've heard, the uh, damage rates are, are not extremely high, but they, they are present, uh, they're, they're readily visible, and so you, you, have, you have to treat the system much more thoughtfully and, and carefully and make sure that you do things in an appropriate sequence. Okay, thanks for that. Um, so I'm just going to feel one last question, which is, uh, will the copy of this recording be available to view at a later date? And yes, it will. So please come back to www.materialtoday.com uh, and to see this webinar um, on demand. And I'm afraid that brings us to the end of our question and answer session. That's all we've got time for. So thanks very much for your participation and your excellent questions. Any questions that we were unable to answer today due to time constraints will be passed on to our speakers who will then try to contact you later with an answer. And so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Mohan Anand, David C. Joy, and Michael W. Feneff for their presentations. And I'd also like to thank all of the attendees of today's webinar. I hope you've all enjoyed the presentations as much as I have. Please don't forget there will be a recording of this webinar that will also be available online very shortly. And in addition, why not listen to our interview with distinguished professor David C. Joy, which can be found through the Material Today website. And here's another reminder that this year we'll see our next Material Today virtual conference, which will be our second annual event exploring the frontiers of microscopy. Please check back to materialtoday.com for de dates and details. And finally, don't forget that we'll be running a whole series of exciting webinars this year, so please check back regularly for details of our forthcoming events. Thank you all once again, and have a great day.